I'd like to talk about uh, eigenvectors and eigenvalues. And th these are special vectors and numbers that are associated with given tensors. So I'd like to start with a, a vector v and consider what happens if I apply a tensor to it. So if I apply a tensor to it, it will in general change its length and it will also change its orientation. So it will in particular no longer be parallel to v. But there are special vectors v that will, after application, of s still be parallel to the original vector. Okay? And so those are called eigenvectors. So they have the property that if I apply s to them, then they're going to be equal to the original vector, but simply rescaled. So it will be pointing in the same direction, but it will just have a length multiplied by a number lambda. So lambda is a number, v is a vector, and so v is the eigenvector, if you will, and lambda is the eigenvalue. Okay, so, and it's the eigenvalue corresponding to the eigenvector v. So for every special vector of s that has this property, it's going to have its own eigenvalue. Okay. And I can rearrange the equation. I can bring everything to the left-hand side and factor out the v, and I have s minus lambda identity v is equal to zero. So here, here I have a set of homogeneous equations. Uh, that I need to solve if I want to figure out what the eigenvector is. So, and for a homogeneous system of equations to have a non-trivial solution, the determinant of the first part, the part in the, the parentheses there, needs to be equal to zero. So I need to have that condition there. And so what I can do is I can expand out this condition, and that's going to actually give me an equation for lambda. So I can figure out what lambda is, and then I can plug back in to this expression here, and then I can solve for v. So it's a kind of a laborious uh, algebraic calculation to do in general. Uh, normally, you would not do this by hand. You'd use something like MATLAB or Python or Mathematica or something, or if you had a graphing calculator, it will probably do it also. Uh, so it, it's more important to kind of understand how what the structure of the calculation in, is and what the meaning is of the results as opposed to being able to manipulate it and, and do the actual calculation. But notwithstanding, um, the requirement for to figure out the eigenvectors is that the determinant of s minus lambda identity be equal to zero. And we can expand that out. So if I expand that out, what I'm going to get is a third order polynomial in lambda. So there, the first coefficient is minus one, the second one is i1, next one is minus i2, and the third one is i3. And I'll I'll explain what those are in a second. Those are known as the, the principal invariance of s. So they depend, the coefficients depend on s. So here are the definitions. i1 is the trace of s, so sii. i2 is called the second invariant of s, and here's its definition. It's 1 half trace s squared minus the trace of s squared. So you square the tensor first, and then you take the trace there. And I've given the additional expression there. And the third and in principal invariant which is called I3, is the determinant of S. So the coefficients depend on S. And it's a third order polynomial, so it's going to have three roots to it. Uh, so, and they can be anything. They can be real, they can be imaginary, they can be complex. It depends on the tensor S that you're working with. Okay, so three roots. And for each root, you can plug back in to the defining equation for the eigenvalue, and then you can then solve it for the vector v. And what you get is not actually a single vector, you get a family of vectors. Uh, and usually what we do is we just pick in that family the one that's of, of unit length. So any vector that points in the same direction of v qualifies as an eigenvector. So we take the one that has length 1 by default. That's the convention. Okay. So they're all parallel, and you select the one with norm 1. Okay, so now this is the general setup for eigenvectors. Uh, we don't need the most general case or understand the most general case. The case that's really important to us is the case where the tensor S is symmetric. So, so for S is being symmetric, you can prove, first of all, that the eigenvalues that you compute are actually real numbers, so, and there'll be three of them because it's a third order polynomial, so we'll call them lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, and they'll have corresponding eigenvectors. And in general, uh, if, if lambda 1 doesn't equal lambda 2 is not equal to lambda 3, so the roots are distinct, then we'll call the vectors v1, v2, and v3. 
okay? And one of the really important properties that comes up for symmetric tensors is that if we have this case where we have distinct roots, then the vectors, the eigenvectors, so the vi's, so v1, v2, v3, they're mutually orthogonal to each other. So they're 90 degrees to each other. And the nice thing about that then is that we can use them as a basis. So remember, we're also requiring, we're going to pick the one that has unit length, so we'll have an orthonormal basis if we want. So we don't have to use E1, E2, E3 as a basis. We can actually use V1, V2, V3. So give me a symmetric tensor. I can calculate three eigenvectors, and I can use those as a basis if I want. And that actually sometimes, uh, while it sounds like a lot more work, actually can make some calculations a lot simpler. So... Let's just look at one observation that comes out of this. Suppose I, I, I'm going to multiply s by the identity. So that's just equal to s. And I'm going to represent the identity as vi outer product vi. Uh, and, and that's because I'm using the v's now. We're thinking of the v's as a, a set of basis vectors uh, for a coordinate system, right? Because remember, before we had, had written the identity as ei outer product ei. And now I'm just replacing E by V because I've recognized that the eigenvectors of S, when S is symmetric, form a basis. And now let's continue with that. I can recognize that S acting on VI is just going to be lambda I VI. So I'll have lambda I VI outer product VI. And I stick in the summation sign here. So I equals 1 to 3 because I ended up with three subscripts here. And Anytime uh, that would violate our, our, our summation convention if I just left the summation sign out. So I had to put the summation sign in here. So th this is a very special representation of the tensor S. So this is just S here. And this is known as the spectra spectral representation of S. So the lambda i's are the eigenvalues of S, and the v i's are the eigen corresponding eigenvectors. If I were to write S in components and put them in a matrix, and I'm doing the components in the VI basis, the matrix representation of S will just be a diagonal matrix, and the elements will be lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3. So this is greatly simplifies it. So if you had a general S which, where all the components are filled in, but it's symmetric, in this basis, you can actually write the same thing, but it's going to be diagonal. So it's going to be a lot easier to work with. Um, now, what I've written here for the spectral representation theorem is the case where you have distinct eigenvalues, lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, not equal to each other. If you have repeated eigenvalues, let's say lambda 2 equals lambda 3, not equal to lambda 1, then, then it changes just a little bit. I, I won't go through the details, but I'll write the result here. So, so we'll have one eigenvector associated with lambda 1, and associated with lambda 2 and lambda 3 actually will be a plane of eigenvectors. Any, any vector that's orthogonal to V1 will qualify as an eigenvector. And, and usually what we do is we just pick two of those that are orthogonal to each other, but we don't have to. The, the spectral representation looks as follows. We'll have S is equal to lambda 1, V1, V1. So that would be like the, the first term out of our expression over here for the spectral representation. And then the second two terms, the ones with the lambda 2 and the lambda 3, we can write as follows as lambda 2 identity minus v1 outer product v1. So the proof of that's a little involved, but this is the representation that one gets if you have two repeated roots. If you have three repeated roots, so lambda 1 equals lambda 2 equals lambda 3, which I'll just call lambda, then in this case, actually every vector v qualifies as an eigenvector. And then you can write S is equal to lambda times identity. So that's the spectral representation in the case of three repeated roots. It's a technicality that you know, sometimes one needs to know. Usually if you're doing manipulations and, and derivations, it's, the, it's this first representation here that's most important. Uh, let me just close with one last remark about the invariance of S. So I gave you uh, those more complex expressions, say, the first invariant, so this should be the first invariant here, I1. Um, let me just fix that. 
So the, the first invariant of s, uh, which is the trace of s, will be lambda 1 plus lambda 2 plus lambda 3. Uh, the second invariant can be expressed as taking the roots two at a time, multiplying them and adding them. And then the third invariant, which was the determinant, can also be expressed as just multiplying the three roots together. So that's just a handy fact to know uh, about uh, the invariance of a tensor.